Our conversations continue here in Davos 2024. Joining me now is Infosys is Salil Parik. Salil, many thanks for joining us, and it's great to have you here uh, joining us in Davos. Uh, you've probably had a bunch of client meetings already over the last two days that you've been here. What's the mood that you're picking up on? What's the temperature like? So first, thanks for having me here, Shireen. Wonderful to be here. Uh, the, the client meetings are just uh, uh, extremely good, uh, uh, very positive uh, thinking from most of the clients. Uh, economies in uh, Europe, U.S. Uh, looking like uh, they, they're coming to may, maybe not yet in, in terms of uh, full recovery, but at least they see uh, their work uh, behind them in terms of what the issues were. Of course, uh, the conversations are, are positive, but we, we want to make sure we see that translated into what we do in terms of digital programs. Uh, so the mood is positive. Is it better than what you were expecting? Uh, and what does that indicate in terms of their ability to go out there and spend? Because that has been the key concern. Right. So we, we, we've not seen a change in, in clients starting to put digital programs in yet. But... The, the way the discussions are going, there's a lot of interest in all of those conversations. There's also interest in cost and efficiency takeout. And then there's, of course, uh, a very strong theme on generative AI, which is all across the world economic But world. it's still wait and watch then, largely. Yeah, so there's no new change uh, from, from what we saw in the quarter, which we announced last, last week for Q3. Uh, it's not that we see new programs immediately starting. But what I find is the way clients are discussing things, they have a positive frame. You know, let's talk about the quarter, Salil. And I, of course, uh, you did speak, uh, uh, but we didn't get an opportunity to really go dig uh, deeper into, uh, into what could have led to what has been a fairly difficult FI23 for you. And if I were to just take a look at what's happened in the year, two guidance cuts, one tightening. Uh, you started with 4 to 7%, ended at 1 and a half to 2%. What would you attribute this to? So there, the, the main things we saw, as, as you might know, in Q1 and Q2 were where we saw the digital programs not becoming part of what clients were doing. So most of the focus was on cost and efficiency, uh, automation, lean programs. Uh, that part of the business was doing well. And then if you look at it from an industry perspective, financial services, telco, uh, high tech, that's where we saw mo most of the impact. Whereas uh, manufacturing, life sciences, uh, these industries were doing well. And then if you look at in Q3 specifically, uh, Europe was growing quite nicely and US is where we saw the impact. So th those were the dynamics uh, as we came into the year. Uh, now, we, we do have to keep in mind the previous year we had 15% and yeah. the year before 19. So we had already a strong base that was coming in. And now we see a, a real uh, focus much more on uh, cost takeout efficiency that's been going on and many more discussions on generative AI. So, you know, as far as generative AI is concerned, it's very hard to, to make your way around Davos without having a conversation around generative AI. But in the near term, realistically, what is it going to mean for you as a company? You know, I was just talking to the global CEO of PwC and he said we're overestimating perhaps his view uh, in the near term, the impact and the implications of generative AI and perhaps underestimating it in the long term. But how are you reading that at this point in time? What are you doing about it? So there, um, our sense is every client is looking at what generative AI can do for them. And there are already, yesterday we had a discussion where I heard a large company CEO talking about tremendous benefits they've seen, for example, in customer service area. We've seen benefits in software development using large language models. So the benefits are there. Now the question is uh, how the scaling is going to come. Uh, our approach uh, we've shared before is what we call the narrow transformer approach, mm -hmm. which is really focused on the data within a company. And there you get tremendous benefits and potentially uh, less impact of hallucinations and so on. So we think that will really accelerate. We, we don't have a view on what the trajectory of that is. But what could it potentially be? And what kind of investments would you need to make in order for you to be able to beef up the capabilities on this side? So for us, the investments are massive. You know, we've ourselves positioned as an AI first company. So we are using all of these things inside. We have assistance, AI assistance now for each of our functions whether you look at HR, recruiting, sales, delivery. So that, that is a transformation inside. We have 100,000 employees 
trained on generative AI, different large language models, mm -hmm. and on various ways to look at the data architecture, which is going to become the key. So our investments are huge. Topaz uh, our AI capability drives all of this. We, we now have to see, you know, what is the speed of adoption mm -hmm. that different clients will look at yeah, and, and different that, industries. And that's what I was getting at. Where do you believe we're going to see an accelerated pace of adoption? Are there any sectors in specific where you believe that the conversations are far ahead uh, and maybe somewhere it's still incipient? So here the, the discussions are in each of the industries, but the overlay is still where clients are not spending on transformation programs. So my sense is... What we were driving with digital transformation with a cloud foundation will be now enhanced with an AI or generative AI transformation. Mm. So when that, by industry, uh, as, as people start to look at the ability to spend, uh, th this will start to come back. You know, so if the, the mood is cautious, it's still wait and watch, and you believe that uh, the spends will be largely on cost efficiency uh, and not so much on the transformation kind of uh, deals that uh, you were hoping for. What could that then mean as far as margins are concerned in the near term? And when do you realistically expect, uh, you know, your peers are talking about a pent-up demand uh, situation playing itself out. Do you see that as well? So a so couple of things on that. First, on margin, we put in place uh, several quarters ago a very comprehensive program on margin expansion. And that, in part, has given us the underlying strength of the margin, even in Q3. And even as we go ahead, we've got uh, detailed views on five pillars, various tracks, a big mobilization. So my sense is that is going to give us tremendous benefit. And in this sort of an environment... How would you quantify tremendous benefit in terms of margin expansion? It'll be quite large, is, is my sense, because the, the way we are working on it in an environment where cost efficiency for clients is paramount, uh, and where growth was uh, uh, not as visible, uh, we've taken the opportunity to make our um, operations more efficient. So we see that uh, as a, a real uh, change in the way we're running the business. O on the second part, I, I don't know, uh, I think uh, you mentioned about the pent-up demand. Yeah. My sense is there is a need in companies for this sort of a transformation. Uh, the question, at least in our minds, is w when clients will start to see that. And we, we are not... At least we don't have a guess on that, but we'll see it when it happens. Uh, you know, TCS talking about green shoots in BFSI, is that something that you're seeing as well? Uh, we, we have no. So what we commented on was that the, the environment remains similar to what we saw in Q2, neither better, neither worse. You know, you, you talked about uh, the efforts uh, underway to expand margins. In light of, uh, you know, the experience of FI23, which, as I pointed out, has been a tough year, any other course correction, any other changes that you're likely to make or are planning to make? So in terms of changes, firstly, the margin is more an evolution, so not, not really a big change in direction. We always uh, have a high margin approach. Uh, our strategy, I think, is, is firmly in place, which is focused on digital AI cloud, uh, cost and efficiency, a big focus on really large transformation programs or large deals, which we had 3.2 billion in Q3, 70% net new. So we see good strength in that. Uh, and then continuous uh, focus on making sure that our, our margins are in good shape and, and really uh, elevating our brand. We've, you know... Uh, have now uh, Rafael Nadal as a brand ambassador, Iga. So it's really taking us to a different level with the way we are showcasing what Infosys is doing. You know, you talked about uh, deals, and there was a cancellation announcement that came in of an MOU, and I know that you said that you will not comment any further on that. But what, what seems to have gone wrong there? So there, uh, as, as we had shared in the uh, announcement we made at that time, uh, the, the MOU was uh, uh, terminated, but there's no other sort of additional comment from our side there. Okay, L let's talk about what we're seeing happen as far as the talent wars are concerned. And there's plenty going on in Indian tech at this point in time. Uh, you know, a couple of uh, your former colleagues are here in Davos in new avatars, uh, uh, starting out new innings as well. Uh, is, is that a concern, uh, senior, senior exits at the leadership level? No, first, I think, uh, you know, all, all of our Infosys leaders are fantastic, and I'm really delighted. Uh, they're good friends also. They're really delighted they're, they're in those roles. 
we are fortunate. Uh, we, you know, very quickly put together the structure where a lot of people from within have moved into new, uh, l larger responsibility roles, and that seems to be working really well. My sense is we have. Even today, a, a really deep bench of uh, leadership people. So I don't see any real concern. In fact, there's a huge energy, and sometimes with change, you, you get some new new focus and attention as well. Uh, so on that front, I mean, are, are you reviewing or relooking, uh, you know, at, at the, the the way that your leadership roles are at this point in time, given the exits? Uh, no, we, so we announced that yeah. uh, maybe six, seven, nine months ago. So it's all done. It was there was no change in the structure. The same structure. A very strong focus on go-to-market with industries, very strong delivery organization. And, and you know, these are individuals who've been with the company 20, 25 years, yeah. very strong Infosys uh, approach. So uh, re really fortunate to have that. Uh, what is unusual, and it's playing out across different companies differently, we've got, uh, uh, you know, Wipro that's, uh, that's suing Jatin Dalal, and that matter is now in arbitration. We understand that you've written to, to Cognizant about a no-poaching sort of uh, informal agreement. What's going on as far as these uh, talent wars are concerned? So I, I read some media reports uh, about uh, about that. Uh, so no comments from our side on so that. So you haven't written? Uh, no, no comments from our side on what I read in the media about it. But I know I also saw uh, some some sort of company suing another company. Uh, I, I'm sure sure that goes on. Yeah. Well, Salil, it's always a pleasure. Many thanks for joining us here in Davos. Appreciate your time. We wish you the very best of luck uh, for the year ahead, and look forward to hearing more from you through the year. Lovely. Thanks. Thanks very much. Well, we are going to take a break here, but the conversations will continue. We're back in a moment. That was Salil Parikh of Infosys. More coming up on CNBC TV 18.